Welcome to our spotlight on sickle cell disease. My name is Robert Klein. I'm chairman of the governing board of the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine created by Proposition 71, the California Stem Cell Research and Cures Act of 2004. Today we're focusing on a disease that hits children but continues to burden their life and limit their options through their adult years. We have the benefit of two great scientific advocates this morning who are participating in this. <laughs> and the program will be introduced by Dr. Bert Lubin, a member of our governing board. Uh, Dr. Lubin is the president and chief executive officer of Children's Hospital Research Center, Oakland. Uh, he began his career with an MD from the University of Pittsburgh and then followed with a residency <coughs> at Philadelphia Children's. After Chil Philadelphia Children's, uh, where he had his pediatric residency, he had a residency in hematology at Boston Children's. A tremendous background for the task he was going to undertake in spearheading the efforts in California and in this country in dealing with sickle cell disease. <laughs> he began the sickle cell screening, counseling, and education program at Children's Hospital Oakland, and importantly, through his knowledge, he began the newborn screening program in the state of California, which is an important contribution to the early detection of this disease. He has served on the NIH Executive Committee that initiated the cooperative study of sickle cell disease. And he is committed deeply to the quality of life improvements and to the avoidance of the crushing debt that sickle cell disease brings to families, family members, affected by the disease, as well as the cost burden for California. By the time an individual patient is 45 years old, the cumulative cost is a million dollars. It is therefore extremely important from a quality of life standard, from the patient's individual vision and hope for the, in the world, and from the cost for California health care. But Dr. Lubin has another leadership role in stem cell research in California because he has been the vice chair of the State of California Standard and Ethics Committee that parallels our standards committee, making certain that the standards for stem cell research outside of CERM funds are, har are harmonized. This is extremely important for the efficient collaboration of researchers using our funds and other sources of funds in this state. Dr. Lubin is also on the advisory council for the Secretary of Health of the United States on, on blood and stem cell transplantation, another important coordinating role because California and our discoveries need to be integrated into a national system of health care. So for a man who has been in the leadership of the state, who is one of the leading advisors in the nation on this disease, uh, it is particularly appropriate that he introduce our program this morning. I would wish you to give a large hand of uh, applause to Dr. Bert Lubin. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Well, that was quite an introduction. <laughs> I don't think I can follow Don quite as well, but I'm, uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to be on this board. Uh, for a long time, I have advocated for work related to sickle cell anemia that CIRM would be involved in, not only because I'm passionate about that disease, which I've worked on for 40 years at Children's Hospital and recruited Dr. Elliot Vichinsky, who now runs the program, and helped recruit Dr. Mark Walters, who runs our transplant center, where we've transplanted a number of children who no longer have sickle cell anemia and are cured of their disease. And seeing how that happens and how their lives change 
makes a dramatic impact. But what I think is really important is that this demonstrates CIRM's commitment to minority health, health disparities, and social justice issues. And I think when you look at the people in the state of California who voted for Proposition 71, uh, there's a substantial number of minorities committed to improving the health of people within their classes. And this program that we have today is an example of a phenomenal uh, a project that actually has the potential for widespread benefits for African Americans in the state of California. As Bob mentioned, uh, we do screen every newborn in the state for sickle cell anemia, and 150 newborns with sickle cell anemia in California are detected every year. 150 new patients. We have 9,000 patients in the state of California. And the cost of care for patients with sickle cell anemia, younger patients, Bob mentioned the cumulative cost, but it's in the range of ten dollars to $15,000 a year with state budget crunches and with cuts that, are, that we are anticipating occurring, especially among patients covered by Medicaid or CCS, which are most of the patients with sickle cell anemia. This is going to create a major burden. So any approach that can change that or has the potential to change that not only has economic benefit, but has phenomenal quality of life benefit for the child and for the family. And the work that Dr. Donald Cohn is going to present to us today has that potential. And I'm just so pleased that CIRM recognized this and that this work uh, is, lead, is led by Don, who has the expertise and the background to accomplish this daunting task. I also, before I mention uh, Don's work, want to point out that, that what led to this application was a lot of basic science and the mass models. And the value of, of those models may not have been as appreciated at the time, but when you take the information from that and begin to translate it into a potential for human disease to treat it and cure human disease, it's remarkable. And I've given lectures on sickle cell anemia for the past 40 years, and usually someone raises their hand and says, have you ever cured a patient? And now with bone marrow transplant, which has major limitations because of the number of donors and the, and the complications associated with it. But with this approach that Don is, is, is proposing to do and hopefully will be successful, more of us that are giving these lectures can say there is an opportunity for cure. And with identifying children at birth uh, and considering interventions before complications occur, it has an enormous impact for our society. And being California being the leader among the world in this particular area. So I think CIRM was wise in choosing this program. OK, now I'm going to talk about Don. Uh, so Don is currently a professor at the University of California in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and Molecular Genetics and Pediatrics. So there are two pediatricians in this room at least. There may be more, but Don and I are two, if three. Phil, sorry, Phil, uh, three pediatricians in this room, but uh, we're trying to get more and more because all diseases start in childhood, whether you can identify them or not. So if we can intervene in childhood, we won't have them as adults. Uh, he attended the University of Wisconsin, where he received his MD and then performed a pediatric residency at, at the University of Wisconsin. And after that, did a postdoctoral fellowship in immunology at the National Cancer Institute. And then he moved to Children's Hospital Los Angeles, which is where I first met him, and the University of Southern California in 1987. And he became a professor in pediatrics and microbiology in 1997. He was an attending physician in pediatric bone marrow transplantation for more than 23 years and was head of the Division of Research Immunology Bone Marrow Transplant at Children's Los Angeles from 2002 to 2008. He relocated his research group to UCLA in 2009, where he is now the director of the UCLA Human Gene Medicine Program and a member of the Broad Stem Cell Research Center and the Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center. His principal areas of research are the development and application of methods for gene therapy of primary immunodeficiency using autologous bone marrow stem cells. And I can tell you, Don, that we in the hematology field are grateful that you extended that immunology success to an area that, that uh, we feel is extremely important and very prevalent. He has an international reputation and actually characterizes the basis of basic research translating into therapies for human disease. And translational research is what this is all about today, and you'll hear more about that. 
Um, he uh, um, uh, received an enormous amount of recognition for the first clinical trial of gene therapy for an immune deficiency uh, that's characterized as the bubble baby disease. And by correcting that and performing a clinical trial of gene therapy for this, for another disease called severe combined immunodeficiency, and in developing a new trial now that you'll hear about for stem cell gene therapy of sickle cell disease. Performing a clinical trial with gene therapy is not an easy task. It takes persistence. It takes many committees who were reviewing this very carefully. It takes compassion, and it takes strength. And Don has all those characteristics. Um, he was the recipient of many awards, the March of Dimes, the Elizabeth Glazer, Glazer uh, Doris Duke, as well as many grants from the NIH, the American Cancer Society, the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and, the, and now CIRM. He was, he was president of the American Society of Gene Therapy, 2003 to 2004, and it's remarkable that we have somebody with these qualifications in California pursuing this, and he has served numerous leadership leadership positions in the society. He was appointed to the NIH Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee in 2010 for a four-year term reviewing all U.S. clinical gene therapy protocols. So this is really an expert in these areas, and for me to have an expert with Don's background uh, applying it to sickle cell is wonderful. Now you're going to hear about how he's going to do an approach that really overcomes many of the problems that we have with bone marrow transplantation in sickle cell patients. Um, some of you know I started a cord blood program where families who had a child with sickle cell disease and were having another child, uh, cord blood banking was offered for free, and many of those cord bloods matched the child with the disease and were used for transplant and have cured the patient. But major, it's a major cost. It's a major challenge. Not all were cured, and some children died in the process. With the approach that Don is proposing to do with this CIRM grant is to use autologous stem cells that have been genetically modified so that the disease that occurs because of the sickle cell gene is blocked. And he'll tell you the details of that. And I think that this is a marvelous approach because there's a donor. The donor is the patient itself, the patient herself, himself, and then the major complication, a major complication with transplant is, is the transplanted cells develop an immune response to the recipient and cause a disease called graft-versus-host disease. This will not happen with autologous cells. So um, it's really an honor for me uh, to, uh, to introduce Don. Uh, I think we're all fortunate to have him in our state, and for all the patients with sickle cell anemia, I want to thank you. probably should not say anything after an introduction like that. Uh, that was better than Bob's introduction, I think. So, well, thank you all. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk for about 20, 25 minutes about uh, our work. And um, let's see the next slide. Here's, my, here's, the, here's the outline of the topics I'll cover. So I will do a little background on sickle cell disease. Um, understanding it at the, the molecular basis explains the approach we're taking. Then a little background on hematopoietic stem cell transplant or bone marrow transplant as sort of the current clinical approach. Um, and then I'll talk about the idea behind gene therapy for sickle cell disease. I'll do all that in 10 minutes. And then I'll tell you about the work we've been doing over the last year on, a, on our disease team project of, of stem cell gene therapy for sickle cell disease. So just as, as background, sickle cell disease is an inherited blood disorder due to a mutation in the gene for beta globin protein of hemoglobin, which is the major oxygen-carrying protein in red blood cells. And as, as has been mentioned, sickle cell disease uh, disproportionately affects uh, African Americans and other minorities, about 1 in 500 in the U.S. African Americans and about 1 in 36,000 Hispanic Americans suffer from sickle cell disease. So the estimate is that there's more than 80,000 people in the U.S. affected by sickle cell. Uh, and it's a very complicated medical disease coming from a single mutation. Uh, and patients have a lot of problems, including recurrent sickle pain crises, um, an, an entity called acute chest syndrome, um, and then they can have sort of strokes in multiple organs over time. So the spleen early on gets damaged, increasing res uh, susceptibility to infections. Kidneys over time get less and less effective. There can be strokes and other problems. So there's very poor progressive quality of life. 
and in fact, early mortality. And so in the last 20 years, the survival in the U.S. for patients with sickle cell disease has not improved significantly, so average mortality or average survival is only 35 to 50 years. So this very complicated slide has all of sickle cell disease on one slide, so I'll, I'll take you through it. So starting the upper left, um, red blood cells are basically bags packed full of hemoglobin protein. So hemoglobin is a protein made of four chains shown in the different colors, two are beta and two are alpha. Then each one has a heme component which has iron, and that's why you need to eat your spinach, because the iron in your hemoglobin is what carries oxygen. And so there, there's a gene that codes for the alpha chain and a gene that codes for the beta chain. And it, it, the first human disease that we understood the molecular basis was when Linus Pauling showed that in the beta globin chain, the sixth amino acid, which is normally a glutamine, which has a charge on it, has mutated to become a valine, which is sort of a neutral, non-charged amino acid. And so that one change in one letter in the whole three billion genetic code leads to all those clinical problems that I mentioned. And so what, ha what happens is, this is showing, um, this would be three hemoglobin molecules, the two beta and the two alpha chains. So that valine that's, that's substituted in sickle cell winds up being on the surface of the hemoglobin molecule, and it can make contact with an adjacent one at a, at a pocket that it likes to stick to. And so under conditions of low oxygen, all the hemoglobin molecules in the red cell actually polymerize and come out of solution. So the red cell goes from being a very flexible, sort of a baggie full of corn oil, to very, very rigid, sort of a corn flake. And these then get stuck in the small blood vessels. And so that's sort of what causes the disease. And the, the key fact underlying the approach we're taking is that the red blood cells that I was talking about come from hematopoietic stem cells in the bone marrow. So our, our union requires we show this slide at all talks. Um, and so when we do a bone marrow transplant, we are basically introducing new hematopoietic stem cells from the donor that will make all the blood cells for the patient, including now normal red blood cells. Uh, just one more comment from this slide. There's a protein on the surface of these early cells in the bone marrow called CD34, and there are now actually clinically available devices that will pull out the CD34 cells from whole bone marrow. So in our cell processing, we actually take a patient's bone marrow, pass it through this column, and just collect sort of this, this early fraction of cells, and that's what we use as our gene target. So background on hematopoietic stem cell transplant. So it, hematopoietic stem cell transplant is also the clinical practice known as bone marrow transplant. And this is most, and, and we can get hematopoietic stem cells either from the bone marrow, we can chase them into the blood with growth factors, or we can get them from umbilical cord blood that Bert referred to. Um, and these are used clinically very routinely to regenerate the blood forming cell capacity. So most commonly, this is applied for patients who have very bad forms of leukemia that won't respond to conventional therapy. So there they're given very high doses of chemotherapy, hopefully to eradicate the leukemia, but as a side effect, it kills the normal bone marrow. So the transplant then is done to replace the hematopoietic stem cells that were unintentionally or collaterally damaged with the anti-cancer therapy. Transplants can also be used to restore the blood formation or hematopoiesis in patients who have bone marrow failure states. So there's a relatively rare condition called aplastic anemia where the bone marrow is attacked or stops working. There are rare instances of exposure to radiation or chemicals where the bone marrow is the most sensitive tissue, is therefore eliminated and can be replaced with a transplant. But I'll be talking about the third application, which is basically to give the patient new bone marrow to replace bone marrow that carries a genetic disease. And I'll talk today about sickle cell disease, although we are doing clinical trials for bubble babies with immune deficiency. So this, this slide just kind of cartoons the, the process that I just talked about. So the, pa the, the donor is asleep in the operating room, face down on the table, and two, two operators r remove uh, bone marrow from the back of the pelvic bone, which is a place you can get a needle into and pull out a fair amount of bone marrow. In our trial, then, we'll be processing it in the lab to genetically modify it. And then once we know we have a good cell product, the patient is then conditioned, as we refer to it, is given high-dose chemotherapy to eliminate their own bone marrow. And then the bone marrow cells that have been processed are given back to the patient. And actually, they're just given into the bloodstream. And so the bloodstream communicates with the bone marrow space. So once we've put the, the bone marrow cells in, they circulate through the body and they'll, they'll home to the bone marrow and start growing. And so the, the really, the medically challenging part of a bone marrow transplant is what happens next, 
because the patient's just gotten basically the neutron bomb that's wiped out their bone marrow, and it's going to take several weeks for the bone marrow to recover and take over their blood cell forming um, activity. So it's the medical care during that time period that's really the, the hard part of transplant. So the potential benefits for sickle cell disease for its transplants is that if successful, as, as Bert again referred to, it can lead to a cure from the disease. So for patients with sickle cell disease, this could mean no more painful crises, need for transfusions, no further organ damage or, or restrictions of activities. And when you talk to people with sickle cell who've had successful transplants, it's really life-changing. Life and they really go from being a chronically ill person to a healthy person. Um, Unfortunately, it won't correct pre-existing problems, so if the patient's had a stroke or has already had some renal damage, that may not improve, but it should prevent further problems afterwards. So if transplants are so good, why don't we do more of them? Um, so the numbers are out of about the 80,000 or so affected in the U.S., in the order of only 250 to 300 people have had transplants, so less than a half a percent. Um, transplant was first done for a patient with sickle cell disease in the mid or early 80s because the patient had developed leukemia and needed the transplant to treat their leukemia, um, had it, and it also eliminated their sickle cell disease. So it gave proof to the principle that by giving a patient new bone marrow, you can correct the disease. And so of the 250 to 300 that have been done in the U.S., and probably about that number worldwide, about 90% of them have been successful if there's a matched brother or sister who can be the donor. And so the transplants have mainly been done for children with sickle cell with a matched donor. Uh, we know that adults in general have higher risks of side effects from transplants. Someone with sickle cell as an adult is more likely to have medical problems that have accumulated than a child. The problem is most people don't have a matched sibling donor. So if you go by typing, there's a 25% chance that any two children with the same parents will match. And so most people don't have a match. And so the, the, a major goal of the whole field of transplant for many decades now has been to find ways to transplant people that don't have a matched sibling donor. And the two major ways um, that have been done are to use unrelated donors. And this can either be adults who are identified through the National Marrow Donor Program that has more than, I think, more than 15 million people typed, and we can look in the computer banks for if there's a type donor who matches a patient, or there are many now uh, cord blood uh, banks that have stored away thousands of units of cord blood that we know they're typing, and we can sometimes find a unit of cord blood that matches the patient. In general, these transplants can be successful, but the risks are higher even though they, match, they may match for the major tissue type antigens we look for, they're likely to be less well matched than a brother or sister. So the immune complications are higher when we use unrelated donors. And the main reason is, again, Bert referred to this, is that donor T cells within the marrow, so when we pull the marrow out, some of their blood comes along with T cells in it, that can react against the patient. And that's the entity we call graft versus host disease, so the grafted cells are attacking the body they're in, sort of like the flip side of an immune system rejecting an organ. Now the organ, in a sense, is rejecting the, the body that it's in. And so hematopoietic stem cell transplant can cure sickle cell disease by, pro by providing the stem cells from a donor with a normal beta globin gene, but lack of donor availability. Some people don't have a match even with the National Marrow Program and the cord blood banks. And these immune complications of rejection, which happens in about 5% of the transplants where they, especially in sickle patients, where they've been transfused a lot, they're sensitized, they reject the graft, and their sickle cell disease comes back. Or the flip side, graft versus host disease, those are major reasons why they're not done more. And so because of these risks, it's mostly done for patients who have more severe complications or risk factors. So we're kind of taking maybe the sicker patients, and it's a very uh, difficult decision. So considering a transplant, for a patient with sickle cell disease, a very complex decision involving medical, ethical, family, personal decisions. And it's, you know, there is no formula. It's really a, a one by one. You have to think about these risks, the benefits, and some people want to take the risk and some people it scares them. So that's the background to what we can currently do medically um, today. So the idea then going forward is to try and improve upon bone marrow transplant from someone else. And so the, the key concept of gene therapy using stem cells is that by correcting the gene in the patient's own stem cells, no immune reactions will occur after the transplant. 
and there will be better outcomes with fewer complications. So that's the hypothesis that will be tested over the next decade or so as, as these trials are done. And so the simple task is to fix the gene in the stem cells. If we fix the gene in any cell later, these cells are transient and only last for weeks to months, so the effect will be lost. But because hematopoietic stem cells last a lifetime, if we can take them out of the patient, fix them with the gene, and I'll talk about how, and give them back and have them engraft and grow permanently, then the patient should have their own source of normal red blood cells for the rest of their life. So that's, that's, that's the vision. So gene therapy is a new technique that's been developed over the last 20, 25 years, and a, a large focus of it has been to treat genetic diseases by adding a good copy of the missing or broken gene to the body cells of the patient. If the new gene works, it would correct the genetic problem in these cells. And so for blood cell diseases, fixing the gene of the patient's own bone marrow hematopoietic stem cells, which are then transplanted back to cure the problem. And specifically for sickle cell gene therapy, the goal is to add a normal beta globin gene, I'll show you actually a supranormal, to the bone marrow stem cells to allow normal red blood cells to be made. And so this kind of just cartoons the, the, the clinical process of collecting a patient's own bone marrow in the laboratory, adding a gene that will correct the genetic defect, giving some chemotherapy or cytoreduction, reducing the amount of bone marrow the patient has with chemotherapy, then giving the cells back to the patient. And so this attempt, or this, this approach has been attempted over the last 20 years or so, mainly for patients with immune deficiencies. And in the 1990s, it didn't work at all. Now in the last decade, it is working. And so in recent years, gene therapy has cured several patients with uh, immune deficiencies, including some in our, in our trial here. Um, and other rare blood cell diseases, like the Lorenzo's oil disease, there was a, a successful trial for in France, by gene correction and transplanting their own bone marrow. Um, and I'll, as I'll show you, techniques have been developed to transfer human beta globin gene to stem cells to treat sickle cell disease. And in fact, clinical trials of gene therapy for sickle cell disease are being developed at several institutions in the U.S. and Europe, although I, I believe our trial is the only one developing in California. So this is the most detailed slide to go into. So this is a little background on, on hemoglobin. So the, it turns out that the gene that makes beta globin, where the sickle mutation is, is part of a whole complex of genes uh, located on chromosome 11 that's called a beta globin gene cluster. And there are different forms of this gene. There's epsilon that's expressed only in the embryo, and it's better for carrying oxygen at the very low levels of oxygen an embryo will see. And then as the fetus develops, it switches from using the embryonic beta-like gene to using the uh, gamma or, or fetal type globin, which makes a good hemoglobin for carrying oxygen when you're a fetus. And then after you're born, your bone marrow stem cells switch over to using the adult uh, beta and a little bit of delta. And so it, it, they're kind of arrayed along the chromosome in the order in which they're used. And we now know that upstream from these genes, there's sort of the master switch, the locus control region, that allows this chromosomal region to open up and be copied into the messenger RNAs. And so again, as, as Bert mentioned, it was really a lot of very careful, detailed mouse studies in the 80s and 90s that unraveled the, the understanding of how this region expresses itself. And it turns out if you want to get good expression of the beta globin gene when you insert it into the cells, not only do you need all the information around the beta globin gene that has the instructions how to make that protein, you also need some of these elements from the control region. And when I show you our vector, it has basically this region as well as pieces from this master control switch. So most red blood cells in adults have what's called hemoglobin A, which is two copies of the beta and two copies of the alpha. Uh, but in fact, we all still make a little bit of fetal globin, about 1%, although some people make as much as 10% fetal globin. And so the observation was made 25, 30 years ago that patients with sickle cell disease who express more than, in, in this study they use a cutoff of 8.6% fetal globin, i.e. less than 90% of their globin is, is the sickle, have a milder disease and actually a longer survival. So this is from a paper from the 1994 showing the survival in sickle cell patients with less than 8% fetal globin with an average survival of about 40% or 40 years. In those who had the higher levels of fetal globin, they actually lived longer. So this really changes the biology of the disease. And one of the mainstay drugs now, hydroxyurea, basically induces the bone marrow to make more fetal hemoglobin. And the reason that fetal hemoglobin is beneficial is shown here. So this is that slide I showed you before. 
So in the gamma globin uh, or fetal globin, right on the surface here, it doesn't have that pocket for the sickle globin to snuggle up to. It's got another charged amino acid that repels it. So it's actually a dominant anti-sickling. And so if you overexpress fetal globin, you can prevent the sickling, even though the cell still has the normal amount of sickle globin in it as well. And so that's, that's sort of the, the rationale for the approach we're taking. And so this is the, the gene delivery vector that we're trying to bring to our clinical trial. So it's got the beta globin gene that was that small red box previous, and those are some of those upstream control elements. And so through a lot of trial and error, vectors have been made that can carry this much genetic information into stem cells intact. And the, the changes that were made in this globin gene is there are some amino acids that are changed to make it like gamma. So because it's beta, it will get expressed in the adult red cells of our patients, but it has the anti-sickling properties of gamma and can reverse the sickling in the cells. So this was made by a scientist, Tim Towns, at the University of Alabama, who went from looking at this in the laboratory and doing biochemical studies to actually studying it in a sickle mouse model. And so this is blood from a mouse where all the mouse globin genes have been eliminated and only human beta sickle have been introduced. So all the red cells that make sickle, just like here, they're also sort of pale and, and have low amounts of hemoglobin. He took this vector, put it into the mouse bone marrow, transplanted the mice, similar to our clinical scenario, and basically all the red cells were corrected. The, 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 the mice untreated developed kidney failures. The corrected mice did not develop any kidney damage. So he corrected in the mouse model everything you could look at with this vector. And then he stopped working on it. And so our project starts where he left off. And so our proposal was that we would take this vector and see if it was suitable to test in a clinical trial. So that's really what our, what our project is about. So this was the flow scheme I just brought up to date with the more current members that, that went in our application grant describing how we were going to attempt to do this preclinical work to test this vector and bring it to a clinical trial. And so there's two, three major components, I guess. There's the human subjects component, uh, there's the laboratory part, and then there's the administrative core. And so the way this was set up was that the human subjects are, include uh, investigators at UCLA, Children's Hospital of Los Angeles and Children's Hospital of Oakland, which are probably the three centers in the, in the in state that see the most patients with sickle cell disease. And so clinicians from those sites are involved in informing us on how to design the clinical trial. And then they are also now actively enlisting volunteer patients with sickle cell disease to give us bone marrow samples for our research studies. So, the, so, this, so they're enrolling um, patients to come in and voluntarily give a small sample of bone marrow which then comes over to the laboratory component where we're using them as the material to test the gene correction strategy. Um, and then uh, this group will also help with the, the study design in terms of here's how to do the cell processing, here's how to measure the endpoints. And so for, for this component of it, we have scientists here at UCLA. Elizabeth Reed has just joined as a consultant who's a world-renowned expert in cell um, therapies. Um, we have myself, uh, we probably will make the clinical grade vector at Indiana University. Uh, then the team of people who are sitting in the back row there who actually do all this work that I'll show you. Uh, and then Herb Mosman at USC is a sort of an expert in red cell biology and will measure the cells we make in our preclinical studies to tell us whether we've reversed their sickling. So these were our major uh, milestones in the grant application. So in year one, we would perform efficacy studies of the vector in bone marrow CD34 cells from sickle cell donors to determine whether sufficient beta globin would be made um, to reverse the anti-sickling effects. And so I'll show you some of our, our studies from the first year. Um, then the plan is going forward to perform the studies that will enable us to apply for an IND and then to also qualify the assays that we'd use in, this, in the trial to make sure that they're, they're robust in, in terms of the measurements. Then in parallel, uh, aim three here is to develop a clinical protocol and all the associated documents for the regulatory applications. There's about anywhere from eight to 10 different committees that need to go through this, and each one will have a different opinion on how you should do your trial. And so you basically start off, you make a draft document, you send it through the system, and it gets improved as it goes along. Uh, then once we've accomplished this, the goal would be in the last year then to apply for all these regulatory approvals. So this was our, our timeline for the study. Uh, we just completed uh, year one recently, so I'll tell you about our, our progress in the last year. The goal at the end of this year period now, which we're about to do, would be to request with the FDA a pre-IND meeting to get their advice on how we should structure different parts of the trial. 
And then the goal is by the end of the fourth year or sooner, we hope, to be ready to open the clinical trial. So these were our goals for the first year, uh, to develop a clinical network that I, I talked about with the children's hospitals and, and here at UCLA, to obtain bone marrow samples from patients with sickle cell disease for the preclinical research studies we're doing in the laboratory. Uh, we manufactured a small gr research grade prep of the vector that carries this gene. Then we've done a lot of work to try and optimize transferring this beta globin gene into human bone marrow stem cells uh, to measure the level of globin that we make. Um, and we've developed a system I'll tell you about to take bone marrow stem cells and in a tissue culture within three weeks, turn them into populations of pure red blood cells. So sort of do that process in the test tube and measure the, the production. Uh, then we're working with Dr. Mosleman over at USC to look at the functional properties of these corrected cells and then at the same time in parallel, we're developing the clinical trial and the protocol. So this is a slide, this is probably too small to read. This just shows that in the last, uh, now I guess about 13 months, we've gotten from our network 18 samples of bone marrow from volunteer sickle cell patients. So here, they came from all three institutions, CHLA, Oakland, UCLA. Um, most of them had standard sickle cell. Some of them have a compound disease, sickle cell. And from these, then, we've, we've extracted the, the stem cells and froze them away. So we now have a bank of 18 samples we can use for research. And these are the studies, the, the samples that we're using for the studies that I'll show you. And so the system that this, my, my group established in the lab is shown here, where we start with these stem cells from the bone marrow of either patients with sickle cell disease or healthy donors as controls. And then by culturing them with a variety of growth factors that drive them to become red blood cells, so erythropoietin and other factors to get an expansion, and then just erythropoietin and a few other goodies like insulin to make them mature, we can wind up in about 18 to 21 days with cultures that are about 90% just enucleated red cells. So there's a few nuclei in here that are the bigger purple things. All these other circles are, are red blood cells that were made from these stem cells. And these are just some markers showing that when we start out on day one, the cells all have the CD34 marker on them, and they lose that over time, uh, whereas they pick up expression of the red cell markers, glycophorin and um, transferrin receptor, and then staining for beta globin is showing that, in fact, the cells do have beta globin in them. And so we've been using this system then to measure when we do this differentiation, how much globin do we make from our vector? We think we need at least 10 percent of the beta globin to be from our vector compared to the 90% sickle globin that's in the cells. And so using the same differentiation system where we start with the stem cells and make the red cells, we can then take these and do a variety of measurements of, their, uh, of the effect of our vector. And this is just one of them where we're looking at the proteins that are made in the cells. It's kind of a classical method for looking at hemoglobin isoelectric focusing. The sample is put on the gel and it separates by its charge. And the different types of hemoglobin band out. And so here's the, the standards. So down at the bottom is where normal hemoglobin A bands. It turns out that our AS3 globin bands at the same place. And this is where S sickle globin runs. And so when we take a sample out of a culture that was started from a patient with sickle cell, but no vector was added, we see that the only hemoglobin it's making is hemoglobin S, or the sickle globin. Whereas in the cultures where we added our vector, we are now making the anticyclin globin and if we quantify how much there is per copy of the vector, it's about 15 to 20 percent now in about four or five experiments. Very, very con surprisingly, consistently, the amount of expression we're getting of our globin is 15 to 20 percent above our 10 percent target. So this is the first time that, that we know of this vector has been studied in human cells, and it seems to, if anything, work a little better in human cells than it did in the mouse cells, and it makes sense because it's human. And if we measure how many copies of the vector there are in the stem cells is about one to two, which is just about the amount of gene transfer we want. So then going into what the clinical trial would look like, so the, it would be like that one I showed you earlier with the baby, we would take bone marrow from the patient with sickle cell disease in the laboratory, process it to isolate the stem cells, add with this lentiviral vector this anticycling beta globin gene, and then freeze the cells away using small samples then to test it and make sure it meets all the release criteria for sterility, uh, the, the vectors in there, a variety of other things. So we have a whole list of release criteria. And once we know that we have a suitable product for the patient, they would then be admitted um, and get their chemotherapy, then receive the transplant, and then, then follow it afterwards. <clears throat> 
So where we do the cell processing, part of the reason why I relocated to UCLA is they have a very wonderful facility for doing this. So in the, in the cancer center, there is what's called a GMP facility, uh, ultra clean rooms for cell processing in the red area, which is right next, in fact, where the CIRM shared laboratories are for either early stem cell work or sort of preclinical work. And so working in one of these rooms, we can process cells suitable to give to patients. Most of the trials that have gone on here in the past have been for cancer immunotherapy, but this is, will now also be the site at UCLA where clinical stem cell therapies will occur. And so just a, a few elements about the, the clinical trial. And so our, the group of clinicians that I showed you, the, the clinical part, we have a lot of heated, vigorous debates about what types of patients should be eligible, how should we approach them. And although I'm a pediatrician, as we've talked, we sort of evolved around to the conclusion that the first patients should be young adults. And so we're talking about um, adults 18 or older who have the diagnosis of sickle cell disease and who have some degree of disease severity. So we have some specific complications that the patients need to have to be eligible. Again, ethically, we don't want to treat people who are doing so well that the risks outweigh possible benefits. Um, we, we felt that anyone who has a matched sibling donor or even a good adult match unrelated donor should be excluded. So we're going to look for about, it'll be about half of people who are otherwise qualified would, would not have a suitable donor. And then we have specific inclusion exclusion criteria for their state of health, et cetera. So the, the primary objective of the study is a safety study. It's a phase one trial to examine the safety of lentiviral mediated gene transfer in patients with sickle cell to receive this vector transduced bone marrow cells after giving them chemotherapy with busulfan, which is a drug that wipes out the bone marrow-like radiation, but it's, it's not as, as toxic, so it's commonly used in transplants. Then the secondary objective, so it's really a phase one, two, will have some efficacy endpoints to try and measure how well did we do this, how many stem cells took up the gene and engrafted based on measuring how many of the blood cells have our gene that we introduced in them to measure how much beta globin gene is expressed in the red blood cells by the isoelectric focusing and other methods, then to examine sort of at a cell level what are the effects of expressing this globin gene on the sickling of the red cells, again using Dr. Meiselman's assays and others, and then the, really the bottom line will be to determine the effects of this gene expression on the clinical and laboratory manifestations of the disease in the patients. So just to go through uh, in the last two slides what we've done and what we're doing in the next year. So this is sort of that same list I showed you of our goals for the year. And, I, and this has been the best I've ever had a project work in my lab in 25 years doing research. I think it's because of the good people I was able to recruit to do it. So we've developed the clinical network to obtain the bone marrow samples. Uh, we've manufactured actually two or three batches of clinical grade uh, vector for our, our laboratory studies. We think we've optimized the gene transfer steps and how to do it, although we're still now moving into a scale-up phase. Uh, we've assessed the expression of the beta globin gene by growing these cells in culture. Uh, we are just beginning the uh, functional studies to see how good the cells are. And just in the past few weeks, we've been sending cells over to USC, and they're, they're measuring um, in, the, in the starting cells how well they sickle or, or not. Um, we're looking at how well, once we've done this to the cells, they still have their stem cell activity. Um, part of the studies in the next year or two will be safety to see are there any effects on the stem cells by adding this virus to it? And then we've also developed our draft clinical protocol. So our, our goals for this next year are listed here, and it's to continue these functional studies of the functional effects of the gene transfer, uh, to hold a pre-IND conference with the FDA to obtain their guidance on the various elements of the clinical trial, the design of the, the definitive preclinical pre studies for efficacy and toxicology that we'll do over the next two years, and uh, the cell product manufacturing process. So we'll give them our proposal for these three components. We'll ask them specific questions. They'll tell us yes or no, and hopefully give us some hints of what they'd like to see when we send our, our actual IND application in. Uh, we, once we know what they want us to do for our toxicology studies, we will then have a preclinical batch of vector made, sort of under the same conditions that the clinical vectors made, although without all the full testing that would be required for clinical use. Um, and then we will test the activity of that in more patient samples in terms of the gene transfer, the expression. Uh, we have a series of toxicity studies planned, both in a cell culture model as well as in vivo in mice. Um, and then we also are continuing to define the cell manufacturing process in the clinical trial. So I'll stop there just to acknowledge all the people who've given me support uh, in doing this work. Uh, the Broad Stem Cell Center, led by Owen Witte, is a great place to work. I'm very happy being here. And, and 
So Owen, uh, Dr. Gasson from the Cancer Center, the deans of the School of Medicine and School of Life Sciences, uh, my chairs in, in micro and in genetics have all been very supportive in bringing our group over here and, and getting us going. Uh, my lab overall has funding from the NIH, obviously the CIRM Disease Team grant. Uh, we have a, a grant from the Doris Duke Foundation to try and work on sickle cell gene correction directly. That's probably version 2.0 for the future, and a little support from the Diabetes Foundation uh, for a project we're associated with with UCSD. Uh, this is my group that actually does all the work, and uh, again, the, the, the team that's been doing this is in the back seat, and they're, I think, the ones who really deserve the applause for the amount of work they've done in one year. So I'll stop there. Thank you.